Okay. So this is Maddie Whitler, um, a great mandolinist who you just moved here from Boston. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's right. Um, so how old were you when you were introduced to bluegrass? Um, I'm not really sure. I got started playing music when I was nine, and I really started on the fiddle playing like Texas style fiddle, which is, um, you know, it's still like American roots music and it's folk music, but it's not quite bluegrass. But mm -hmm. probably my first exposure to bluegrass was seeing people at those contests who played bluegrass and would jam at the contests. Um, and uh, my parents listened to country music, and so there was some bluegrass in there that I was kind of been familiar with. How, um, how did you come to pick the mandolin if you started on fiddle? Um, I, I like went through a bunch of instruments. I started on fiddle and then I got a mandolin because a lot of the fiddle contests that I would play in would have a picking contest, which was just like any picked instrument. So it was like mandolin, guitar, banjo, um, anything, all in one category. Um, and so I got a mandolin because then I could play my like fiddle tunes on the mandolin in the picking contest. And then, so I had one for a long time, but I didn't really practice it and didn't really care about it. And then when I was like 11 or 12, from like 11 or 12 to like 14, I was just like banjo, only banjo, and just really obsessed with Scrag style banjo, and thought that's what I wanted to do. And then when I was like 14, um, I got a call to join a band, and they needed a mandolin player. Mm -hmm. And so I joined the band on mandolin, and that was the first time I was really like playing with other people, and that like music really clicked, and that was also like at the same time that I got into super into Nickel Creek and Chris Thiele and then I, that was it and I was just like 14 years old on is like all mandolin all the time. So you said that like you kind of grew up listening to country music and bluegrass. Mm -hmm. What drew you into it to like make you want to do it rather than have your parents have you listen to it? Um, yeah that's interesting. I mean my dad grew up listening to folk music in the 60s and like love Bob Dylan and all that stuff and always talked about how he wanted to learn to play an instrument but he never really did um, and so just like the idea that playing an instrument was a cool thing to do was always around um, I remember the first time like thinking I want to do that with an instrument was watching um, Garth Brooks and seeing his fiddle player Jimmy Mattingly and mostly because he was like really like wild and would run all over and and just like do all this stuff but he was a really good fiddle player too and so seeing him play was like probably the first time I thought like oh yeah I want to be a musician I want to be someone performing but I never wanted to be the person in front I always wanted to be the person like taking the solos on an instrument yeah yeah so that's how I got into it and then I had an aunt um, who played Texas style fiddle and still does and um, she kind of just like being aware of her and aware of that made it made me aware that like that was a thing you could do yeah one could choose to do <laughs> so you just moved here from Boston yeah why did you come to New York City um it was kind of on a whim like I it's um just kind of having a lot of uh a lot more time to do other projects than my main project um, and so there's just more opportunity to do that in New York um, my roommate Mike Robinson who you have interviewed I think you've interviewed all my roommates yeah, at this point so this is the whole house um, he just said he was like oh our fourth roommate Joe is just like up and decided to move to California and we're kind of in a tight spot and we need a roommate and just like in that moment that Mike told me which was in like November late November maybe mm -hmm. I was like great I'm moving to New York like that's what's happening so that's what I did and it's turned out 
Great, yeah. I've been here for a few months and having a lot of time off from the band right now. And so spending a lot of time in New York and then the band will pick up again in the summer and do some touring. Um, so you've been playing in the scene for a really long time. Mm -hmm. How would you say it's evolved? Or how have you seen it evolve well, since um, you started? That's interesting. I often think about like how it's evolved from like a time before I was evolved involved in it but like I guess from when I was involved in it was really like the time that I feel like I started really involving myself in bluegrass and caring about it was like right at the oh brother where art thou nickel creek like there was mm -hmm. this like boom it was all because of oh brother where art thou like that was huge featured on the oscars and like it was just all over the place you couldn't escape yeah. it and then i actually have never seen it oh it's a great movie it's fun um but the soundtrack like i listen to that soundtrack all the time it's such a good soundtrack um and yeah and the, I, and i mean the cd that goes with it because it's not even really the soundtrack because there's a lot of music on that cd that's not quite actually in the movie but mm -hmm. um but that launched a whole thing and Nickel Creek was like on the country, pop country radio charts and you'd hear them around. And so I got into them and Allison Cross and Union Station and kind of the, those slicker bluegrass. I used to, at that time, I would have been like, oh yeah, I know about Bill Monroe and Flatten Scruggs, but it's just like too like rough and loud and just like, yeah. that's not what I'm interested in. I just wanted to be in Nickel Creek, but... Um, <laughs> How have I seen it evolved? I think when I first got into it, it it felt like a smaller scene maybe of like mm -hmm. young people playing it. And then with every, just like every few years, it feels like the scene of people that were that age, like teenagers or in college age um, is just like growing. And so this, I don't know, like the level comes up, but I also feel like we're getting to this point um, where like we've had like true masters of every instrument we've had yeah. Chris Thiele and Bela and Noam and Edgar Meyer and Stuart Duncan and just like and Jerry Douglas and you know we've just had people really take these instruments as as far as you can really imagine them going and so I feel like now what's left to do for bluegrassers is to just like focus on making good music. Yeah. Um, which I think is a funny, I don't know, there's, that gets into the whole thing in bluegrass. Um, so you mentioned that there were a lot of younger people playing. Yeah. Why do you think, because in general, what I've noticed at least, is that in New York most of the people playing, um, like half of them are like late 20s, early 30s, mm -hmm. and then the other half, um, are like 50 or 60. Yeah. So why do you think there are so many younger people playing? I think the, like, just the, oh, brother, where art thou, making it cool. And, you know, that, that whole thing also leads to Mumford and Sons, and, and then there's the whole jam band scene, which is a whole phenomenon. And, and um, all of these things, you know, make make it cool for young people to play bluegrass I guess and so and that was what got me excited was you know I was watching Feely mm -hmm. when I was 14 and he was 24 and so he was doing it he was like still a young person who was just really doing this thing and it was new and it was, it was exciting and so I feel like just seeing it just having like people to look up to and see doing it is is like a big thing um and so, you know, there's just more and more of those people and more people to get excited about. And so that gets more young people into it, I guess. But, yeah. Um, do you have any, like, standout experiences playing? Um, yeah, I've got a lot of interesting experiences. I would say a real, like special experience for me was playing Rocky Grass um, because I had gone to Rocky Grass. I grew up, grew up going to Rocky Grass. I went there like six or seven years in a row 
and um, so to like finally get be in a band that got booked to play Rocky Grass was huge and it was a super fun set and it went really well and and then like another probably like interesting set was like in in IBMA in like 2013 or 14 I played a set with Peter Rowan um, and it was just like a really crazy lineup of people on stage and it was a super super fun set and it was with Peter and Michael Cleveland and uh, Mike Munford and Chris Henry was also playing mandolin so we were playing up there together that was pretty interesting um, yeah, it was very fun. Okay, so you're in the band Lonely Heart String Band. Mm -hmm. How did that form? We started when I was at Berkeley, um, and four of us who are now in the band were at Berkeley at the time. Me, our lead singer and guitar player George, um, our banjo player Gabe, and our fiddle player Patrick. Um, and we originally had a different bass player, Louis Fram. Um, who was also at Berkeley with us. And we were, we had been, started playing gigs around town. Um, there were various like opportunities for Berkeley ensembles to perform at Berkeley events and also gigs in and around Boston. And so we were, we put together some bands mostly around George because George could sing and that was like kind of the key thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think Gabe and I probably have been playing together the longest and then Gabe and I have been playing with George the longest other than Charles who is George's brother but um but yeah so at a certain point we were all playing and we got this gig that was asking us to play um Beatles music on a five-piece bluegrass band and we just like took it really seriously and I remember we were at Freshgrass Festival actually and I was playing there with like a Berkeley band, um, which was with Gabe and Molly Tuttle at the time. And that's cool. It was super fun, yeah. Um, and John Mylander on fiddle and Nick D. Sebastian <coughs> on bass was that band. That was very fun. But um, anyway, I remember we were talking about this gig, and Patrick McGonigal was just like hanging out. And he was like, hey, I want to do that gig. Like, you should yeah. hire me to do that gig. And so he kind of like, you know, we knew Patrick and knew him as a good fiddle player, but like, we might have called Patrick, we might have called a different fiddle player for that gig. And so, because we called Patrick, then he was just, he was in the band, and thank God for that, because he's, he's great. I don't know if we would have stayed together if we had a different person there. But, um, yeah, so that's how the band got started, and then... We played this one wedding and then we had all this material that we'd spent a lot of time on and and we could sell it, especially to festivals, because we could say, like, book us, put us in any time slot. Like, the audience might not know us, but they're going to like the material because it's just the Beatles. And so, yeah. and then we started, like, slowly introducing some original stuff. There would be, like, a couple original tunes and then it would be, like, half and half with some bluegrass in there. And then it would be like, we'd play like one or two Beatles tunes in a set and we'd play some original music um, until eventually it was pretty much all original. Some other covers got in there, but... When I was like six, yeah. my neighbor, um, he played the cello and he was like obsessed with the Beatles. Mm -hmm. And I remember he learned like all the songs he could... It's great music. I mean, yeah. it's it's really incredibly well arranged music. It's harmonically complex it's really a cool way to think about music theory but yeah yeah and it it works great for a bluegrass band you know in thinking we were really trying to dissect the arrangements and put them on our instruments and so when you're picking a song to do that with with a bluegrass band mm -hmm. you have to pick a song that has enough parts to do that with you know we tried to think of some like tom petty covers we wanted to do and we could play any Tom Petty song we want, and we could just, like, bluegrass it, and I'll play cool stuff on it, but if we wanted to do, like, a really one-to-one -one cover of a record, mm -hmm. most of those tracks don't have, like, enough parts going yeah. on that it makes sense, because you have, like, drums, rhythm guitar, lead guitar, and then some pads. 
So the Beatles music is really good because they had a lot of stuff that really had parts that had like moments of instruments coming in and going out and various backup things. So it really worked well for a bluegrass band. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I asked you this, but what draws you to bluegrass like now or playing the mandolin now? Um, I really enjoy playing with other people and and improvising. Um, yeah, I think the most fun I have is playing in groups and then like trying to do what I can to make the group sound better. Yeah. Um, you know, I, when we practice and when I practice, I practice soloing and playing lead lines probably most of the time, but, um, you know, I'm just as happy playing rhythm most of the time. I really love chopping and like kind of grooving along with the band. And so, yeah, playing in bands is what gets me excited and playing with people who are great and inspiring and have good time. I guess me excited, but bluegrass is very cool because I feel like it's it's this great space in which to work on improvisation and playing in a group and mm -hmm. um, you know there's all kinds of different ensembles and situations. You can have anything from a five piece band. You can have duos with any combination of those instruments. It's just like it's really. There's a lot you can do within it, but it's still limited by a certain thing. And as John Hartford says, style is based on limitation. So I feel like I really enjoy working within the limitation of dealing with just acoustic instruments. So that's the appeal. So Bluegrass has a really strong community around it. Mm -hmm. Would you, how would you say like, or would you say that the community around it has influenced how the music has grown? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, you talk about young people getting into the music and part of that is that um, the community makes it, tries to make it easy for young people. I feel like people are excited when they see a young person coming in and interested yeah. in bluegrass and so they want to encourage that person. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's a great, the community is a great thing and I feel like when people talk, pontificate about the bluegrass community, um, they always kind of have a very optimistic view of it, which is that like, you know, it's very welcoming, anyone can join. And like, that is all very true. I think sometimes you encounter various levels of like exclusivity and, and stuff. And, um, but that's the appeal within bluegrass is that you can kind of like there is a level at which you could come in and start and know three chords and like play songs. Mm -hmm. And then there's a level at which you're like a tight five piece band of people that really have studied a lot. And so, um, but yeah, the community thing. I think a lot of that also is just cause it's so, you know, as soon as you have an amp or have to plug in an instrument, it's like suddenly so much less portable. And the community thing, I think, probably evolves in a large part of the fact that you can get together anywhere and jam. And so like, mm -hmm. it's, it's something you, I feel like we as acoustic instrument players take for granted. It's just how easy it is to just like get out your instrument and start playing it. Yeah. It's like unheard of for some people. So. Okay. Um, do you think that there's something special in this genre of music that stands out as opposed to other ones? That draw people in? I mean, yeah, but I would say that about most genres of music, that there is a thing like that. Um, yeah, bluegrass is a very funny thing. I mean, a big part of what draws people in is this kind of perceived nostalgia, mm -hmm. like this idea that it represents a simpler place in time, a better yeah. place in time, this like back in the mountains it's when things kind of funny were it's all about murder. Right, there's a lot yeah, there's a lot of crap in it and like every guy in every bluegrass song is a piece of shit and yeah. like sorry if <laughs> I didn't even think about that, but um yeah. So 
it but but it does represent that to people and that's like what draws people in a lot of the times is this like kind of perceived nostalgia so um yeah it's a weird thing what what draws people in i would say like that perceived nostalgia but then also um when you really get into it what keeps you there is the like high level of playing of musicianship and the individuality of the players and the um, quality of the music because the best bluegrass is some of the best music it's just like really great but there's a lot of bluegrass out there that's not the best bluegrass yeah do you think that if you weren't playing mandolin there would be another instrument you were doing yeah definitely um i don't know what it would be I play a lot of guitar. I play a lot of banjo these days. Um, I've been playing some electric bass. And so I could see like being, if I were to, if someone were to be like, somehow you cannot play the mandolin, I would be very upset because it's like my, it's, it's the instrument on which I feel like I can think and just like yeah. things come out. Um, but you know, I would get to that point on, on another instrument. Um, I really enjoy playing music more than I enjoy playing the mandolin. Yeah. But I love the mandolin, and I specifically as an instrument, it's really cool. And it's like what I, what I like to present is like my artistic expression. But in my free time, and also just playing bluegrass and kind of like working on the tradition of bluegrass, I'm like, will spend a lot of time practicing, kind of straight ahead bluegrass banjo and Tony Rice style rhythm guitar and all that kind of stuff so yeah I would definitely play something else mm. would you probably yeah when I was five my dad tried to teach me guitar but I didn't really want to practice at that point so yeah it didn't really take off but it's it's really funny to be in bluegrass and see what kind of like personality types gravitate towards which instruments mm -hmm. um okay so we have one more question yeah I've heard that you know a lot of like trivia trivia that's just what about bluegrass about. yeah or like you know a lot of history or something do you have any fun facts fun facts or something um probably but i i mean i don't know there's just there's so many weird little little bluegrass stories i mean i don't know bill monroe stories like do you know the one uh, about him? Um, there was a photographer who was taking his picture and it was like this. And he's like, hey, Bill, uh, could you step back for a second for the photo? Mm -hmm. And Bill just goes, no, you step back. <laughs> um, apparently, the first time Bill went to New York, um, he was booked by this guy, Ralph Rinsler, who was a mentor and friend of David Grisman's. Mm -hmm. I think David was the one who told this story. Um, and Peter Rowan was in the band at the time, so this would have been like the 60s, like 63-ish. And he That's went... a long time ago. I know, right? Um, and he went to New York and I was playing some show in, like, in the green room before the show. They had, had a spread of bagels and like cream cheese and some other stuff. Mm -hmm. And so Bill you know, goes and, and eats one of the, the bagels and the band watches him. And then as Peter Rowan is like walking into the green room, Bill leans in and says, those, those are the sourest donuts I ever ate. Don't touch him. So that's pretty funny. Yeah. There's some, I guess there, yeah, they are. <laughs> yeah. Bagels aren't really in other places. I think especially at the time, you know, stuff was way more regional. You know, yeah. that's that's something that has really changed in the music. Like, I remember when YouTube was, like, a fairly new phenomena and, like, watching videos on YouTube was, like, you know, I would search for new Chris Thiele videos every day because yeah. I'd watch the two pages worth of results that were... Two pages. There are probably thousands. Now. Exactly. Um, so I remember realizing that that was a game changer because suddenly you didn't just get video through like television or mm -hmm. homespun videos. It's like, it's really so different. Like it used to be, I, and I have like some memory of this of like, 
you would get lucky and see some great bluegrass thing on some show on TV mm -hmm. and you would just like remember it and there'd be no way that you could ever like look it up again. You would just like yeah. see it the one time. And so the fact that you can go on YouTube, look up everything, yeah. slow it down, really changes the music and it, it changes it in good ways in terms of raising the level. Mm -hmm. But another thing it also does is kind of, take away regional distinctions yeah so like it makes me really wonder about like old-time fiddle styles when there were all these very specific regional distinctions yeah um now with musicians growing up like the reason those distinctions would happen is because people were isolated and so it's like if you live in this one spot you have access to these three fiddle players so yeah. your style is going to be an amalgamation of those three fiddle players and you get these really specific styles but now it's like your style is an amalgamation of whoever you want to listen to. So yeah. everyone will be an individual, but there will be less like regional specific styles. And that applies to, to yeah. everything. So, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for talking to me. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me. Cool. <laughs> Super fun. Yeah. Thank you.